So welcome back to this new lecture called uh, White Colon Stores. So where are we first? We've already covered storage with S3, cloud storage, HDFS, encoding, how we encode text into bits and syntax. We've seen CSV, XML, JSON, uh, um, um, and uh, YAML um, a little bit. So we, we are here, we are done with this. And then we are going to slowly go up into the data modeling, but there is one more thing I want to show you in terms of, uh, of storage. We could argue it's also a bit data modeling today, but it's data modeling that is still low level on the, on the physical layer. So let's, I told you, we forget about XML and JSON. Let's come back, let's take a step back and look at relational databases. Basically what happens 20 years ago with the, 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 the large companies. A relational database like PostgreSQL is meant to be installed on a single machine, small scale, right? So you fit maybe today a few terabytes of data at most in a relational database. But the problem that these companies had, especially like social networks with billions of, of users, uh, you know, billions, if not trillions of tweets, how do you scale up? How, how do you uh, have a huge number of rows, like billions or trillions of rows that just doesn't fit on a machine, right? doesn't fit. So you have no choice but to scale out, right? Scaling out means you put more machines. These are the clusters in the, in the data centers. So you add more machines. And this is what was tried 20, weeks ago, 10, 20 years ago. They tried to install PostgreSQL or a similar database on 10 machines, 20 machines. Uh, they duplicated the data, right, for backup purposes. So they, they stored the same data on multiple machines. They partitioned the data, as we saw with the blocks on HDFS. So they store uh, maybe the first billion rows on that machine and the next billion rows on that machine, and then a copy of these billion rows on a third machine and so on. So this is partitioning and uh, replicating. The problem is that doing that was a lot of efforts. You, they needed to write a lot of code to glue it together because, of course, installing PostgreSQL and putting data is there, in there is the easy part, right? But accessing the whole cluster of machines jointly in a way that feels like a single big database, this is tough. And it became very costly, very high maintenance costs. How do you avoid uh, 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 inconsistent duplication and so on? Th this was just very, very costly. For this reason, the engineers at these companies, and here I'm thinking, for example, of Google, they came up with a totally new technology called Bigtable that basically integrates this whole thing uh, as, as a proper product and not just some hack around PostgreSQL or a similar uh, relational database system. So the goal was to implement a data management system that is native to the cloud, that is native to the cluster. Furthermore, a good design would be if it could actually use HDFS, in fact, GFS in their case, because it's the Google file system, but now that would be HDFS. So can we use HDFS as the storage layer for files and build on top something that looks like a table, uh, like a relational database management system, but on a larger scale on the cluster? And the answer is yes, this is pretty much what they did. So they redesigned a completely new product called Bigtable, HBase between the Hadoop being the Hadoop version that we'll study here, but that's pretty much what it is, right? So HBase is a white column store that natively runs in the cloud and in that case on top of the HDFS. So the HDFS that we saw two weeks ago. So the reason why this is actually quite a popular alternative is that it gives you another way for storing your data. Um, so here I did a comparison table. I tried to put the plus and minus of, of uh, what, every, uh, what every technology is good for. So the first one would be S3 and blob storage, right? The object stores. The second one would be PostgreSQL. So that's a relational database management system, what we did in the first week. The third one would be HDFS, which we saw two weeks ago. And key value stores, you can ignore because we don't cover them in this lecture. I just put them here for uh, completeness. So the fourth one you can ignore. So what are the, uh, the issues with the existing systems? Well, with S3, you have high throughput, no problem. You have people all over the planet who can download and, and access their object in S3 without any problem, but it's low latency. It takes a few hundred milliseconds to access an object. For a database, that's too much. A database should really be a single digit milliseconds. 
It cannot update. All you can do is overwrite existing objects, right? Large values, that's kind of okay. You can go all the way to five terabytes. Large collections, that's fine too. You can have billions of trillions of objects. Random access, no. S3 is not designed for that. S3 is designed for getting and putting objects, but it's not designed for accessing single bits, right? Then you take relational database systems. So um, PostgreSQL, high throughput, no, that's not the goal. It's a single machine, right? So, so it doesn't have as high a throughput as, uh, as, uh, uh, as cloud storage. Still has a good throughput, right? But I'm just saying not as high as what you get with the uh, HDFS or object stores. Low latency, yes, absolutely. PostgreSQL will give you answers in just a few milliseconds, in particular if you use indices, right? Very quick. Updates, yes, absolutely. You can update your tables in SQL without any problem, insert values, update values. Larger values, yes. PostgreSQL actually allows you to store large values. Uh, it's able to store that efficiently. Larger collections, no, because you cannot go beyond the one machine. Right. So you might manage to store a, a billion rows if you really squeeze it into your laptop, but trillions forget it. Um, random access, yes, absolutely. In PostgreSQL, you can have random access to any cell anywhere uh, very quickly. Right. So this is absolutely supporting random access. What about HDFS? HDFS supports high throughput. It's a cluster of hundreds of machines, so it can be accessed concurrently. Low latency, no. HDFS takes a while. I already told you that when you enter your command, it takes a few seconds, one or two seconds when, before it answers. So this is even worse than S3. Um, updates, no. HDFS is not meant for updating data. You can only overwrite completely. You can maybe append at the end of a file, but that's all you can do. You cannot update in the middle of a file, so that you cannot do. Larger, larger values, yes. I could even have put a double plus in there because that would be even in a petabyte range. You can have absolutely huge files because they are split in blocks. Larger collections, yes, absolutely. You can have absolutely enormous files. Um, and random access, no, because again, HDFS is not optimized for random access. It's optimized for scanning so the entire. Um, and uh, key value stores, I'm not covering, I said. So you see, what if we want everything? High throughput, low latency, updates, larger values, larger collections, random access. Well, nothing gives me everything. No matter what I pick here, S3, relational databases, HDFS, I don't have any of them that has pluses everywhere. This is exactly why we have white column stores. White column stores are kind of the, the solution to that, that give you everything that the other systems don't. So we have a way as I, to store in high throughput, low latency, immediate access. You can update immediately. It supports larger values, supports large collections, uh, and even with random access to specific parts of the system. How can it be, right? So that's the huge appetizer for what's coming. How can we even do this? How can we get everything and check all the boxes in there, right? So the reason I told you, even though it's the relational model and it has tables, um, the way that I would like you to visualize HBase if you compare it with PostgreSQL. It's a tabular model, just like PostgreSQL. So imagine tables, right? but with a few differences. First, these tables can go into easily into the billions, trillions of rows, right? PostgreSQL can't because you're tied to a single machine. So that's the first thing that's different. The second thing that's different is that the number of columns in an HBase table can also grow easily in the thousands or even millions. In PostgreSQL, typically in the 200s, no more than that, right? If you try to add more than a, a few hundred columns in a relational table, first it's going to become slow, but some system will even not even let you do that, right? As soon as you're at 255, 256, then you cannot add any more columns. So HBase, gives you huge numbers of rows, huge numbers of columns. And the third thing that it gives you is that you can absolutely have huge cells. In a relational database, if you, if you look at the relational tables that the one that I showed you, the cells are small, right? You have just a, a string or a number, right? These atomic values. Um, in HBase, it is actually common to fill the cells with as much as 10 megabytes of data. 
10 megabytes of data in a single age-based cell. That's not the sort of thing you would do, you could, but you would not do it really with a relational database. What are these 10 gigabytes of data that you would put in a single cell? Well, it would be an XML document, it would be a JSON document, it would be an HTML page, it would be a picture, whatever, but you can put as much as 10 megabytes of data in a, in a single cell in an HBase table. So this is why I'm saying that HBase can be considered as the storage, as a storage layer, because it can, it can be used to store XML documents, to store JSON documents, to store pictures, to store HTML pages and so on in the cells. But to do it with all of these boxes checked, unlike you know, S3 or HDFS that wouldn't give you the low latency, that wouldn't give you the updates, that wouldn't give you the random access, right? So this is the appetizer. Now, I can show you a little bit of the model. I'm not sure I will finish today, but just so you see, because the, on the data modeling uh, level, it's quite easy to understand. So it's Google's big table is designed in a way that uh, puts together the data that is accessed together. This in fact is something I've already told you that when you have multiple tables in the traditional model of relational systems, you would have several tables. Every table does one thing, one table for the products, one table for the customers and so on. And then you join them, right? You know how to do joins in SQL. We saw it in the brush up. So you basically join the tables. The problem is that when you look at trillions or billions of rows, joining is very, very expensive. So we don't want to do that. What do we do? We denormalize. So instead of storing multiple tables like that, we just store them together in one table. It would be forbidden if you go to best practices in relational databases, because you want your data to be like this, normally in relational databases. But for the purpose of big data, actually doing that and breaking that rule is totally fine. What it basically means is that instead of having multiple tables, we just have one big table. And that's why it's called big table, actually. That's exactly the whole idea behind that. So now we're gonna have just one big table. We don't even have several of them, just one big table. It might have a bit of duplication in there, but everything is just stored as a single big table. And uh, this is another form of denormalization of the data because we, we don't have to join anymore. So now if you look at the data model, a big table looks just like a relational table in the sense that it's just a huge collection of rows. In HBase, each row has an identifier, each row has an ID, and that ID must be one column, typically the first one, right? So that first column, it is special. It's a row identifier. Here I just put some numbers and letters, but it could be a string, it could be whatever you want, uh, and that identifies the row. This is a bit different than PostgreSQL because in PostgreSQL, you saw that that would be a primary key in PostgreSQL, right? So you can define, for example, a table of people. You can use the social security number as the key, right? Uh, but you can also use multiple columns. For example, you could use the first name, last name, middle name, if it's non-ambiguous and so on. But in HBase, it must be one column that is a special column that contains the row ID, right? And then, something that is different from the relational model is that the columns are grouped in families, column families. So we have the purple family, the yellow family, and the red family. Uh, and this typically comes from the tables when you did that, typically you, you join these two tables into this one, that basically will typically give you one, sorry, one family here from what came from the left and one family of columns from what came from the right, right? So we kind of still preserve the idea that some columns kind of belong together, okay? And I'm gonna stop here, right? So all you need to know for today is we have tables that have a huge number of rows. The rows are identified by a row ID, that's kind of the primary key, so it identifies the rows. And the columns, they are actually grouped into column families of columns that belong together, right? So here we stop for today. And next week, I'll take the time to explain to you how this all work. And in particular, I try to explain to you how we manage to check all of these boxes. What is the magic behind the ability to do all of that at the same time? All right, so thank you very much for attending today's lecture. Uh, enjoy the, exercise, uh, the exercises, which are on XML JSON, right? On syntax. 
uh, and next week we'll uh, we'll uh, look into HVAs. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your week, and uh, see you next week at 8 a.m. Summer time. <laughs>